So it was New Year's Eve 2022, and our family didn't have any plans. We were just hanging out at home, and my mom asked if we could do a favor for her by babysitting a friend of hers' grandson. This friend of hers was having all of her family come into town for a big New Year's Eve celebration. They were going to a restaurant, and it wasn't the right place for a five-year-old. So this woman's grandson, who was coming from out of town, like needed a place to hang out. And she's like, hey, would you mind keeping him? We're like, oh yeah, sure, happy to have him. Our girls planned this New Year's Eve party for him with games and a dancing party and like hats and the countdown, the whole bit. They had a great time. So the, the mom and dad come to pick up their grandson. Uh, or their, their son, around 10 o'clock or so, and Becky and I are already starting to fade. Like, we're like, do we really have to stay up till midnight? Do we really have to? We're at that age where it's like, we've seen enough of midnight in our life. We don't need to see it again. But our two of our girls are like, we have to. We have to make it all the way. So we're in this conversation, and we're negotiating with them about this, and we say somewhere, hey, where's your other sister? They're like, oh, she's sleeping. I'm like, that's weird. Like, that doesn't seem right. And, and right around that time, she woke up, and she comes into the room, and she's like, I don't feel so well. And she goes right to the bathroom, and everything that was inside of her came back up out of her. And fortunately, it went where it was supposed to go, in the toilet. But we knew, like, okay. And we used that, like, as a negotiating strategy to say, see, like, it's probably bedtime. Look what's happening when you stay up too late. And we... We gave attention to her, and the two of them didn't buy it, and they went like, all right, mom and dad are distracted. Let's go have more New Year's fun. And so we take this daughter, and we're starting to get, ready, get her ready for bed and put her in bed. And before we could get her in bed, she threw up again, and that's when we realized, okay, she shouldn't stay in her own room. She should stay on the floor in our room because this is probably going to happen. Like you hope when your kids throw up that it's one and done, but that was not the case. She woke up like three times in the middle of the night throwing up. And th this child in particular uh, can be a little pathetic when they get sick. And so they wake up like, oh, I'm dying. Like they said that before. I'm dying. I think I'm going to die. And flails around. So they're like throwing up in the middle of the night, but moving all over the place. So our job is to get up and like force their head like in a trash can. It goes there. So it's not everywhere else. Now we made it through that night and we said, okay, the worst of it's over, and we were really looking forward to the week ahead because we had friends, a whole family from out of town coming to stay with us for 10 days. And so we were saying, thankfully that happened before they came, not while they came. So our friends get there, a day or two into the trip, like I start to not feel well, woke up in the middle of the night, and I threw up. Fortunately, mine was just that one time, and then I was okay for the next day. But then two days after that, the dad of this family, he also woke up in the middle of the night throwing up. And it sounded like, I mean, it was bad. Like, it was really bad. Like, it sounded like there was a moose upstairs in our house just, like, groaning and growling all through the night. Woke up everybody in the house, and I think even woke up the neighbors next door. It was so bad. And we think to ourselves, once he got better, like, okay, you and I, we bared the brunt of it. Hopefully we're in the clear. We had five more days of our time with them. And they said, the, the husband and wife of this family were like, hey, we'd really like to do something special and unique for your kids. We'll take all the kids. Where would they like to go? And we said, you know, they would enjoy going to Starbucks, so would you mind? And they're like, oh, yeah. So they, they flew, so they took our van, right, because they didn't have a car, and they took all our kids and their kids to Starbucks. And Becky and I are at home. I'm just prepping something for dinner. And they come back, and they are flying into our driveway. Like, they are coming in hot, and I'm like, that seems a little excessive. But then mom and dad jump out of the van, and our kitchen is in the back of our house that kind of overlooks the driveway. And I hear them yell, buckets, get the buckets, get towels. And they, like, come rushing in, because one of our daughters also then threw up in our van. And then, like, two days later, one of their kids, again, threw up in our house. And it was like this week of just everybody getting sick. And it's the worst. There's nothing worse than having sickness pummel its way through your house and everybody gets the stomach bug, right? Anybody been there before? Anybody been there this winter where it was like, yes, that was our reality this winter? There's nothing more demoralizing and discouraging than constantly being sick. And the question that we often ask ourselves in those moments is, will this ever end? Right? Will this ever end? Will we ever get to the other side of this? Because I don't think I can take it anymore. I don't think I can clean up one more mess. I don't think I can hold hair back one more time. Like, I just can't do it. 
And that's true not only with like the stomach bug in our lives, but we also find ourselves in other moments, other situations, where we're just stuck in really hard realities, and we ask ourselves, will this end? For some of us, it is health-related. We do have major health concerns that we wonder, like, will this ever end? For some of us, it's relational issues in our life that are tearing us up. For some of us, it's financial. For some of us, it's unrealized dreams and desires that we wonder may never come to fruition. And in those moments, the question we have to wrestle with is, do I trust God in the midst of them? Even if they don't end, even if we don't get better, if things don't resolve, do I trust God? And then, when those moments do come to an end, when we have made it through and we look back, when those moments are now in the rearview mirror, what do we do at that point? How do we move forward? And how do we think about our relationship with God in those situations? Where well, our passage today is a story of a guy who finds himself in a similar place and has a unique response to when his situation finally comes to an end. This is what our passage reads as we start in verse 1 of John chapter 5. It says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, if you've been tracking Jesus' travels through the book of John, you may have noticed Jesus has been constantly on the move. We started early in chapter 2 and 3. Jesus was down south in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Chapter 4, he's headed back north to Galilee, passing through Samaria. He finally arrives in Galilee at the end of chapter 4. And now at the beginning of chapter 5, he's down south again, back in Jerusalem for another Jewish festival. And we read this in chapter 2. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, and the, the Sheep Gate was just an entrance into the city. Jerusalem would have been a walled city with many different entrances, all having different unique names, the Sheep Gate, the Fish Gate, the Golden Gate. And the Sheep Gate was near the temple, and we're told that near the Sheep Gate was a pool, continuing on in verse 2, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now, if you're following along in one of our in-house Bibles, you may notice that in chapter 5, you read verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and then there is no verse 4, and we jump right into verse 5. Anybody notice that? Even if you're not following along in one of our in-house Bibles, your translation may do the same thing. Many translations do that because it's thought that chapter 4 was a verse that was later added into the text. It wasn't an original verse in the original manuscripts. But the reason it was put in place is because it gives context. It gives context to something that's said later in verse 7. It also gives context to why there were so many disabled, lame, paralyzed people hanging out at this pool. Depending on your Bible, you may find verse 4 in a footnote, and it reads this, From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. So it was thought that this pool had supernatural healing ability. And the first one who could climb into the pool after the water was stirred would be healed. Now, some scholars speculate if the water was actually stirred, it might have been an underground stream or an underground brook that would have actually caused the bubbling up. And so it's hard to know if anybody actually got healed from climbing in the pool. And some scholars wonder, maybe it was like a first century Jewish urban legend that this pool had healing property. We don't, we don't really know because there's no clear account of healing coming from that pool. But whatever the case may be, that mindset, that story created an atmosphere of desperation. It created an atmosphere of longing and hope. Because it wasn't just one, two, maybe three people hanging by this pool. We're told in verse 3 that it was a great number of people. Imagine a pool deck with all of these lame and paralyzed people just waiting and hoping for their time. It created great expectation. 
that they might get well if they hang there long enough. And in some ways, I, I think it's a really good picture of our world. Many people in our world would say they are not well. And they are looking for some source. They're looking, they're putting their hope in something that somebody once told them could make them better. And they're thinking to themselves, if I can just wait here, if I can get in first, or if I can do that, ah, my time might come. And we're told then, in verse 5, of one particular man who's there that day. Verse 5, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, we're not told anything about this man. We don't know anything about his backstory. We don't know anything about his family situation. We don't know if people have brought him there and are picking him up later that day. But what we do know is that for some extended period of time, probably years on end, he sat poolside, not working on his tan, but diligently watching the water, hoping that that day would be the day that the waters would be stirred and that he would have his chance to be the first one to plunge into the pool to experience healing. For 38 years, he sat by the pool watching his own reflection simply age over time. And I got to imagine for him, the question that turned over in his head was, will this ever end? Like, will, will my situation ever change? Will my reality ever be different? Or is this just my lot in life and I have to just grin and bear it from one day to the next? Will anything ever change? Because the same day, every day, the same day, he did the same thing. Every day, he would sit, he would wait, he would watch the water, and he would hope. The next day would roll around and he would sit and he would wait and he would watch the water and he would hope. Then the day after that, he would sit, he would wait, he would watch the water and he would hope. Every day was the same thing. Except this day is a different sort of day. Because on this day, a different sort of power was present at the pool because on this day, Jesus was there. We read this in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. Today, at the pool of Bethesda, it was a different day because a different sort of power was present. It's a power that's relationally rooted. Because Jesus, we're told, sees this man. He saw him lying there. Up to this point in the story, there's no indication that anybody else saw this man. Maybe the only person who saw him was his own reflection looking back at him in the pool, but Jesus sees this man. And when the text says that Jesus sees somebody, it's not indicating that Jesus is simply aware of their presence but he sees them. He connects with them. He, he goes out of his way to show that he understands. He's willing to make eye contact. He's willing to show that I see you. I know your situation. I know your need. One of the things that's frequently said of Jesus in the Gospels is that he sees people. And it's not uncommon that when Jesus sees people, the emotional response connected to his seeing of people is compassion. You, you read in Mark 6 that Jesus saw the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, even though it doesn't say here that Jesus had compassion, that's Jesus' normal response when he sees people specifically in pain. His heart goes out to them. And so this power that is present with Jesus that day isn't just relationally rooted, it's also full of compassion and care. And what's happening here is that the script is being flipped in this moment because oftentimes 
When healing is present in the Gospels, it's the people who need healing who are going to Jesus. They are bringing their friends. They're bringing their family. They're bringing their sick. They're bringing their dying. They're pursuing Jesus and saying, Jesus, we need your help. It's usually the sick and unwell who are going to Jesus. But here the script is flipped because Jesus is coming to them. Specifically, Jesus is coming to this man. Jesus is in pursuit of him. He's going well out of his way. He doesn't need to be at the pool of Bethsaida that day, but he's chosen to go there, and he pursues this man specifically, in Jesus' fashion, with a question. He asks him in verse 6, Do you want to get well? A common question from Jesus is, What do you want? What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? This is simply another version of that question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And I wonder if this morning Jesus is in pursuit of anybody here who also is in a situation where they need to get well and Jesus is pursuing you asking that exact same thing. Do you want to get well? Because no doubt, in a room with this many people, there are individuals who would say, I am not well. Things in my life are not well. And I'm barely hanging on. Now for you this morning, getting well may not mean restoring the use of your legs, But getting well might mean setting boundaries in a certain toxic relationship in your life that is wreaking havoc all over the place. Maybe getting well for you is working through your own insecurities so you can release the pressure you continue to place on your kids to perform, 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 because your true deep fear is that their poor performance will actually reflect bad on you. Or maybe getting well for you is taking the first step in naming for somebody that you can't go to bed at night without first drinking a full bottle of wine. Or maybe getting well for you is also naming that at one point in time, I had some sort of disease, sickness, or disability, and I I got well, and the thing that helped me get well through my injury was pain medicine, but now I'm addicted to pain medicine, and I can't seem to let it go. Or maybe getting well is making an appointment with a counselor to process through your childhood trauma because it keeps leaking out in anger and rage and you have this destructive wake in your path of people you've hurt along the way. And then you could list all sorts of other things. The question is, do you want to get well? I'm convinced that Jesus is pursuing us this morning, asking that question. What's not well in your life? And do you want to be well? Now, notice this guy's response to Jesus' question, verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Like Miss Jackie said, what what do you notice about his response to Jesus' question? He doesn't answer Jesus' question. Just like Jackie said, if somebody were to come to me and I'm not well and they say, do you want to get well? I'd be like, yes, please, somebody, help me become well. But this guy doesn't answer Jesus' question. What he does is he offers an excuse. He names the reason why he's not well. He doesn't say, yes, I want to get well. Here's the reason I'm not well is because I don't have anybody, is what he says. I have no one. There is no one in my life. And maybe you're here this morning, and you would say that's true of you. I have no one. There's no one who knows what's going on. There's no one who understands. There's no one who would be able to listen and empathize with the concern, the problem, the issue that I have. Maybe this guy really does have no one. 
Maybe you're coming in and you're saying, me too. I have no one. If that's the case, if that's turning over in your mind, I would like to pastorally challenge you in that to say, I don't think that's true. I would maybe even go so far as to call it BS. Because the very fact that you are in this room, if you're online, the very fact that you're tuning in is you have a room full of people who would love to see you get well. There's a staff at this church who would be willing to walk alongside of anybody in need in their path to get well. There are leaders and elders and deacons who would love to see people who aren't well get well, and it's our job as a church to make people know, help people know that you are not alone. Even though you may feel like you are alone, the beauty of the body of Christ, as dysfunctional as it can be at times, is that it puts you in a context where you are not alone. You're not alone. So even though you may be here wanting to get well, thinking to yourself, you have no one, interestingly, Jesus in this moment doesn't concede to this guy's excuse. Now, some people name this excuse, I don't have anyone, because maybe they just can't imagine a life of getting well. They can't imagine their situation being different, but Jesus doesn't concede to let people stay in the dysfunction they're in, because even if this guy truly has no one, and if you feel like you have no one, Jesus is present with this man, and Jesus is present with you, and Jesus wants to make you well. Jesus wants to make you well. And to prove that to this guy, the next thing Jesus does in this story is he performs a miracle. We read in verse 8, Jesus then said to him, in response to this guy's excuse, in response to him saying, I have no one to help me, Jesus simply says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now again, imagine if you're God, this guy, and you're laying poolside, sitting, waiting, watching the water, hoping and some stranger walks up to you because this guy doesn't know that this is Jesus. We'll learn later in the story that he has no idea who this guy is. You're just sitting there minding your own business. This guy comes up to you and asks you some random question on a pool deck full of invalids. Hey, do you want to get well? And then tells you to pick up your mat and walk. If I'm this guy, the first thing I'm thinking is like, hey guy, who do you think you are? Is this some kind of twisted Joke, I've been lying here for years. I've been waiting for my turn to get into the water. And then you're just going to walk right in. You're going to waltz right in on your two feet and tell me just to simply get up and walk. I mean, look at my legs. I imagine they're atrophied. They're weak. No muscle. And he says, get up. Now, we saw last week that there's a scholar who says the signs in John's gospel are public deeds performed by Jesus that reveal who he is, but require faith in order to perceive its truthfulness. It would have been really easy for this guy to say, I have no one, not even you, and roll over and just accept his reality. But in this moment, Jesus extends this invitation to him to get up and walk. And at some measure, it takes faith for him to take Jesus at his word and to climb up onto his own two feet. So maybe he has his doubts. Maybe he has his questions. Maybe he's unsure of who this guy is. But I got to imagine at some point, somewhere along the way, he starts to feel something in his legs. He starts to feel a tingling sensation. Maybe he feels strength restore, and he climbs up onto his own two feet and rolls up his mat, and he begins to walk because verse 9, it says, at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Now, on one level, this moment is an amazing moment in John's gospel. I mean, Jesus has the power just to give an invitation and heal somebody. We saw in the last story, he doesn't even have to be present with people. At the end of chapter 4, he can just say the word, 
and people get well. Jesus has incredible power, and this is an incredible moment where 38 years of waiting, hoping, watching the water to be stirred are instantly reversed for this man. But this moment also raises all sorts of questions. Like, why this guy? I mean, it's a pool deck full of a great number of people in need. And why this guy? And did other people see this happen? Or did it happen in a quiet spot in the corner somewhere? Or did other people notice? And if they did, what were they thinking? Like, me next, me next, me next. Because it doesn't give any indication in the story that Jesus healed more than this one guy. And there are places in the gospel, Matthew 12 being one of them, where it says that Jesus was out healing and he healed them all. He healed all the sick, all those with diseases, all those with need. So why not here? Why not now? Because there are others who saw this happen. And from what we can tell, Jesus performed the miracle, walked right out. It'll say later in the story that he slipped out before this guy could realize who he was. I think one thing that causes excuses to surface in our mind is when we watch other people get well, but our situation stays the same. When we notice that other people's lives are changing and ours stay the same, it causes us to this place of resignation and despair, like nothing will change for me. And the truth of the matter is there are certain situations where things don't get better for people in this side of eternity. Um, earlier in the fall, uh, I was connected with a pastor who is up in the Minocqua area. He pastors a church called Eagle Brook Church. Apparently, there is a Brook Church up in the North Woods. A group of people in the late 80s, early 90s wanted an Elmbrook-like church in the North Woods, and so a group of people started Eagle Brook. And this guy heard of the pastor gatherings that we have of the different pastors in the Brook Churches, and he said, hey, can I be a part of that? Even though it's a far distance away, I'll join virtually and get down there on occasion. And we're like, yeah, sure, that'd be great. So he's been a part of our group for the last six months, and in January, he told us of an individual in his congregation who's in a terrible motorcycle accident. A young man who lived in Rhinelander, uh, was visiting his mom in Manaqua, was on his way home the week between Christmas and New Year's, and as he was riding his motorcycle, he's just going along, there was a car coming towards him, and turned into him and took him out. I mean, he said instantly he was gone, blacked out. The, the doctor said he probably shouldn't have survived that crash, and it was a miracle that he did. He was airlifted from the crash site, to Wausau and had like four or five emergency immediate surgeries to kind of sustain his life. From there, he was transported from Wausau to the, down here to Freighter and spent the next two months in recovery. Half of those two months, he was in a coma. They, they had him sedated. He didn't know what was going on. The, his mom said he lost so much blood that he probably could have filled five people full of blood. I mean, it was just crazy. And so this pastor told us about this accident, and he said, hey, I'm four hours away. I can't get there to visit them. Would somebody down that way be willing to? And I was like, oh, yeah, we're, we're right down the road. I'll go there. Now, as a pastor, you walk into hospital rooms with not knowing what you're walking into on occasion. Or you do know what you're walking into, and it's a really tough situation. And so it's just part of the job where you learn how to walk into these moments and maintain your composure, and usually you can do okay. I walked in, and I sat down, and I started to, to talk to the mom and this young man, and I could barely keep it together. Because what I noticed when I sat down bedside was I saw one leg. And just instinctively, I start looking for the other leg, thinking, oh, maybe it's like covered by a blanket and... Somewhere along the way, I was like, there really isn't another leg. And the mom confirmed, like, yes, in the accident, he lost his leg. Half of his pelvis was crushed, and they have no idea all of what's going to happen. This guy is 20 years old. He's 20 years old. Just sitting there, realizing the rest of his life will be impacted forever. Like, what does healing look like for this guy? Like, what does it look like as he starts to watch people move on with their life? Maybe he, wasn't, he was just driving his motorcycle and got blindsided by a car. We live in a world 
where we can read stories about this man getting healed and be like, yeah, yes, but then many of us sit in situations where it's like, but why not me? With the rest of the people on the pool deck that day saying, why not me? Why not me? Because what you see in this moment is that Jesus does pursue this man. He does perform this miracle, but Jesus also has a bigger purpose. There's a bigger purpose at play with what Jesus is doing, and it happens in this moment on two levels. It happens on a collective corporate level for all of Israel, and I would say for all of God's people, meaning Jesus is doing something in this moment to send a message to all of Israel, specifically to the religious leaders of his day, to say something new is happening. There's something that you're missing. There's something that you're not seeing, and this man is evidence of it. And what you see is their response to this miracle is really fascinating. As we finish on in verse 9, it says, The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and the law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, the Jewish leaders have three responses to this man, right? At this moment, they don't know anything of the miracle, but what they're doing is they're confronting him and his breaking of the Sabbath law. There was this book called the Mishnah that gave extra laws for Jews in the first century to follow and obey just to ensure they wouldn't break the scriptural law. They were an extra layer of laws to, pursue, um, to preserve their purity so they wouldn't break any of the laws from the Word of God itself. And they're saying the Mishnah per, per, um, prohibits you from carrying anything from one place to another. So put down your mat and be on your way. But what's interesting is they also disregard the miracle because the man responds in verse 11, well, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. And I couldn't walk this morning. I can now. And so since he told me to pick up my mat, that's why I'm carrying my mat. And then they asked him, well, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? It's verse 12. So lastly, they grow suspicious. They confront this guy in his Sabbath violation. They disregard the miracle. There's no like, oh, wow, that's amazing. You couldn't walk and now you can. They just like gloss right over that and they're like, who was this guy who told you to do this? They're so focused on their own religiosity that they miss the greater work of God. The rest of chapter 5 is Jesus in a conversation with these religious leaders telling them, hey, you're missing the point because there's a new work of God. There's a new thing that's happening, and this guy is evidence of it. So the bigger purpose comes on a collective corporate level, but it also comes on an individual level. Because we read this in verse 14 later. And Jesus found him at the temple. This is the man that he healed. And said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen. Now, it, it makes people wonder, was this guy like involved in some deceitful, sinful act in the temple? Is Jesus catching him red-handed while committing a sin? And most scholars think it, it's probably not that. This is a similar phrase to what Jesus will say to a woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. There's this woman who's brought to Jesus and all these Pharisees are condemning her and Jesus does some things and kind of confronts them back and says, hey, like he who is without sin cast the first stone. They're all holding stones. They realize, ah, oh, we all have sin in our life. So they drop their stones and leave. And then Jesus looks at this woman and he says, does anybody condemn you? And she says, no, they've all left. He says, great, go and sin no more. It's an invitation to a new way of living. It's an invitation into a renewed life. And so Jesus is saying the same thing to this man. Hey, there's a new way to live. There's a new type of life. There's a renewed life that is now available to you. So go and live that life. He's calling him into something greater, which you might expect this man would be like, ah, oh, the guy who healed me is Jesus. He's ushering in his kingdom. I should follow him and I should commit my life to him because he has just changed my life. But what does he do? Verse 15. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. It's almost like he's snitching on Jesus and he's ratting him out. That's the guy. He's a, let, don't worry about me and my mat. Go get that guy, right? Which is really interesting 
Because what this story does is it bumps up again to the story right before it, the end of chapter 4, where Jesus has this man, again, pursuing him because his young son is about to die. Jesus just says the word, go home, your son will live. And when the guy gets home and he sees the evidence of Jesus' word come to life, and his whole family is now rejoicing because the son is alive, it says the whole family believed in Jesus. You see in chapter 9, a guy who was born blind, couldn't see his whole life, Jesus heals him. And again, he didn't know it was Jesus. Later on in the story, he comes to learn that it was Jesus, and it says he drops to his knees, and he worships him. You have these two stories of people who receive healing and believe and follow Jesus, and then you have this guy in between them who seems to rat Jesus out, which raises the question, why are we pursuing Jesus? Are we pursuing him simply for what he can do for us? Or are we pursuing him because of who he is, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who has his bigger purpose, and he's calling us into a bigger story. And the hard reality of that story is sometimes in the here and now, we get glimpses of new creation affecting our life, and sometimes because of the effects of sin in our world, we don't. But at the end of the day, Jesus is who Jesus is. He is the true king, and what he is doing is he has a bigger purpose of bringing all of creation on a path towards full restoration, which means one day, as it says in Revelation 21, all will be new. All will be made well. There will be a new heavens and a new earth, and there will be no more sickness, no more dying, no more pain, no more crying, nothing, because all will be made right. And so we, as people in the here and now, who long to be made well, sometimes we might be made well. But for some of us, we may not fully be made well. The way that we respond is not like this guy who just walks away. That's what the text says. It says that this man went away. He left Jesus and went away. Instead of following this man's lead, even when our life isn't perfectly made well, we move towards Jesus, trusting that he is good even though things now, in the here and now, aren't fully resolved. And what's really fascinating is that early in verse 3, it says, a great number of disabled people used to lie by this pool. That word disabled people is a 21st century modern term. Like that would not be an ancient Jewish Greek term. The actual term there is people who were weak. Meaning you could read... That verse saying, a great number of weak people used to lie there. And what does the New Testament say about how we, as followers of Jesus, perceive our weakness? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, we actually boast about our weakness. We actually boast about things that we struggle, not in a kind of like twisted sort of victim way, but we boast about our weakness because there is one who in our weakness becomes strong. There is one who makes us strong in the midst of our weakness so we can still follow the bigger purpose of God in our weakness, trusting that he is at work to make all things new. And so the question for us then is how do we respond, both on the back end of maybe being made well or in the middle of not being made well? We boast in the glory of God because he is good and he is faithful and he is, in fact, bringing all things together for the good of those who love him. And so the invitation to this man is the same invitation to us to participate in the restorative work of God even if he hasn't fully restored you. So the question is, again, what in your life needs to be made well? And can you pursue Jesus and trust him in the midst of it? Not just for what he can do for you, but because of who he is, knowing that if it doesn't all happen in the here and now, there will come a day when all things will be made new. So may you see that Jesus is pursuing you and does desire to make you well. 
May you trust him even if full healing doesn't come on this side of eternity. And may you be willing to step into God's bigger purpose for your life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a good and gracious and faithful God. Lord, there are seasons in our life where it seems really hard to fully comprehend that. Especially when we're facing what feels like insurmountable challenges. So God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see. That you would help us see that even in the midst of our weakness, you are at work to make us strong. That you would give us a desire to pursue you just for who you are. Not to try and get anything from you, but because you are the true king of kings. So Lord, we open our life to you. We ask, Lord, that you would make us well. But even if you don't, give us eyes to see and trust you and follow you. Amen.